everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Squiggly Career Podcast. I'm Sarah and actually this week I'm joined by Helen and we're in the same room. I don't think people know that we often don't do these in the oh, same right. room. So we're, 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 we're really excited about being in the same room but often we record our podcasts over Skype or remotely but today we're here together so Yay. that's exciting. <laughs> And we've done now over 20 episodes of our podcast, which we hope is really helping you to enjoy your career that little bit more. And we've had more than 16,000 listens, which I find amazing. I know, I know, it's so exciting. Though we were just saying that when you listen back, there are definitely some things that we need to get better at. So um, (laughs) I hope those people stick with us. And we've covered everything from overcoming fear of presenting to how to find a new job, building your network, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert. And if there are other topics that you're interested in as covering that you've not heard us talk about yet, please do get in touch because we always really love to hear from you. I think it's one of the things that I'm finding most rewarding as well, other than having time to talk to you every week about stuff that we love. Um, Also hearing from people who have found value in our podcast or they just want to share their thoughts with us and it's on, I don't know, it's on LinkedIn or on Twitter and I just, it's so nice. So please, if you are enjoying this or you've got ideas, do get in touch with us because we read all of the comments and we take all of your feedback and ideas into our kind of planning for the next podcast. I think it's uh, fair to say that we have both had quite a tough week this week. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> the, for various different reasons. And I think the shining light in both of our week has been individual uh, WhatsApp messages or the occasional email saying how much people are enjoying the podcast. Yeah. So we're here on a Friday recording it after quite a tough week, but full of energy and feeling positive because of all of that lovely feedback. So um, thank you. yeah, thank you very much. So let's get on to today. We're going to be talking about, I think, a topic that we have become increasingly passionate about over the past four or five years, and that's flexibility at work. And I think the reason we're really passionate about it is because I think when you have flexible workplaces, when people have the option to work flexibly, that's when people are at their most productive, when they're at their happiest, and that just works brilliantly for the individual and for the organisation. And I think both of those things are um, really critical. But I think flexible working means quite different things to different people. So, like Helen, what's your take on, like, how would you describe kind of flexible working or flexibility to people? Yeah, I agree. I do think it means different things. A lot of people sometimes default to it. It means that you're going to work part time. And actually, yeah. I think that that's a really narrow definition. It is one. I think of it maybe more as like flavours of flexibility. And there are lots of different things. And it's mm-hmm. everything from being able to work in a different place. Yeah. And that you've actually got the technology to do that, for example. Or it might be something more fundamental about actually the structure of your job. You might do a job share. Um, you might have slightly different hours you've got. But if I try and think with all of those flavours of flexibility, what is my definition of, of it? I think it's about an individual having the freedom to define how they can maximize the value they can add to an organization on their terms so they they can make choices about how they yeah. want to work um, and they've got that option with their organization but ultimately it's in service of the business so it's on their terms because yeah. you're kind of you're doing this barter job that your company's paying you to do a job and you're saying i can do the best job possible for you if my work shape looks like this yeah and i think that's rather than a company saying And you have to fit this package, which might make someone tired because they've got a hefty commute or make them unhappy because they're missing their kids. That's not that's not them giving their best. So it's an individual having that freedom to define the shape of their work so that they can add the most value to their organisation. Um, I like that flavours of flexibility. Okay. Yeah, we should, we, should Hashtag. Def- we should definitely come up with like, what are all the different flavours of flexibility? Um, okay, there's an, an infographic coming soon. Um, and what I, where I think flexibility is a more kind of, is an interesting kind of concept is we are moving away from kind of years of working in the same way. So, you know, through, you know, all of work in the last kind of 20, 30 years, people are quite used to turning up, doing a job from, a certain time to a certain time and going back home again and everybody worked pretty much in that same way and now I think things like technology have mm-hmm. given us there's almost some kind of enablers I think of of flexibility I think technology is a really big one I actually think the way that people are approaching parenting is very different mm-hmm. so if you think about you know people wanting to now do you know shared parenting it's no longer just you know, the responsibility of the woman or the mum uh, to look after their kids, which is a good job, I think, for both Helen yes, and I. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we wouldn't be here this morning. Uh, and so I think there are almost some societal and kind of macro trends almost that have then meant that flexibility has become an option. 
or kind of a, poten a potential thing for people. And now people are trying to figure out what does this mean for me and what does this mean for my business. Mm. There's no sort of blueprint, or certainly not that I've seen, of this is exactly what flexibility means and this is how it should be implemented because almost that's the opposite of flexibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like so inflexible flexibility. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's actually quite a complex one for organisations and for individuals to work through. So that's why we thought it was good for us to kind of explore it today and particularly in terms of sharing some of our experiences and then any top tips if this is something that um, is important to you. And I think it is experiences and not answers because I still mm. think there are as you say, I think this is complex and there isn't a one size fits all for an organisation, but I do think organisations need to be more agile and they need to, uh, I don't know, contracting on flexibility is quite difficult because it looks, yeah. it looks so different. So there isn't like a, we'll have two contracts that cover everybody no. because we're saying about if individuals want to define this on their own terms, that that's a lot of different types of contracts. So I don't think we've got all the answers today, but I think we have got our own experiences of people who've been exploring this and experiencing it for a good couple of years now. So what we thought might be useful is to talk about where we've seen flexibility work and where we've had it kind of work for us and also where it hasn't worked. So maybe some of either the mistakes or experiences we've had that mean that maybe we thought, okay, next time we need to do this differently. So let's start with the positive. Yeah, okay. You know. uh, so where has it worked for you, Helen? Um, for me, it has... So my number one value is freedom. Yeah. Um, and uh, that means I don't particularly like to be constrained by pretty much anything. <laughs> but in, in, right. the context, in the context of flexibility at work, I find it very, very difficult to work from the same place. So um, I cannot sit at a desk all day in one building. At just I get sort of bored and I just get distracted and I, I, it just doesn't work for me mm -hmm. and so for me a bit a flavor of my flexibility that's very important to me is being able to work in different places and that could be from a different place in the same building so not being not having a desk that I have to sit at so uh, hot desking it could be working in a cafe with my headphones in and just doing some thinking and creative work that's often where I'm most creative or at my desk or it doesn't really matter I just like I like the freedom to be able to define where I'm going to do different types of work best yeah um, and so you know I work for Microsoft now and they it's, it's amazing because we have the technology to be able to do this and I also yeah. I think also culturally we really value it at Microsoft because I think it's just part of that business so I have the freedom to work anywhere and I have the technology which is I think is a very important point I have the technology to be able to do that too yeah um and so it's it's working really really well for me now I work I work a bit from home we've got an office in London an office in Reading sometimes I'll just go like I say I'll just go sit in a cafe because that's where I might do some more creative thinking and I had a similar thing in Virgin as well Virgin also valued it so I do remember a while ago I worked for Eon and I had a manager it was probably the first time I'd worked flexibly in in, in my definition of this and all my other jobs had been like more you're expected to be in you an turn office. Up, you turn up yeah. and you're in an office. And it was my first people management job and I had a, a manager called Simon. And actually, a lot of my jobs have involved quite a hefty commute. Mm. And I was living in uh, Nottingham and this job was in Coventry. So it's like two and a half hours of driving every day. And I said to that my manager, I think almost nervously, you know, can I can I work from home one, one day a week? And I remember him saying, um, yeah, of course you can. We're all adults here. And it was like the most empowering thing. It yeah. didn't, he, he, my kind of scary ask about this was dismissed. And I was probably, what, 26 at the time-ish, probably about that age. And it really, for me, it was such an empowering feeling for a manager to have trust. You yeah. Know, we're all adults here. You can, you can work how you want to. And I've worked, uh, I think actually since then, all the organisations I've worked at have enabled me to incorporate that flexibility. Like I say, I think the technology is a big part of it. So I'm, I'm in a great place at the moment because... Microsoft have the technology and, and the culture to do it. But that's probably why it's worked really well for me. And I think trust is a really important point, yeah. actually, in terms of, I think with a lot of the things on flexibility, there is, what the barriers is often a nervousness from organisations, from leaders, potentially, in terms of, well, will people still be working? Will they be as effective or as productive? My attitude has always been, you almost have to start from 100% trust, you have to make sure you're really clear with your teams and the people you work with what success looks like, what are the objectives, you know, what are your expectations from someone. One of the professors actually at London Business School talked about how flexibility is becoming a big part of the workplace. And she said about kind of leaders in the future, the role will be to be really clear about what has to be done, but to leave complete autonomy as to how it's done. And I was like, I actually I really that. like that. Yeah, I do. So your role is to know 
what what has to be achieved but then letting individuals be adults and work out well what is the best way for me as an individual to achieve that thing but i think i think um, and some research that timewise have done about the number of managers that aren't supportive of this because yeah. of, because of the issue of trust and i think part of it is because this is harder for managers it's easier i think for a manager to manage presenteeism than it is for them to manage performance through flexibility yeah that's true actually because because you're right it's an they're, easier option they're, they're in and they're, i can see them brilliant job done no not necessarily not very good job done yeah. potentially but actually to manage performance through flexibility where people are defining how they do the best work and you're being very clear about what your expectations are it's a different type of management and I think some people might not might not want that challenge and yeah. so you get a bit of a default no so I think trust and managers are quite a big part of how successful uh, flexibility is yeah and I think for me one of the things that has worked really well in terms of flexibility is changing my mindset when you talk about kind of presenteeism from thinking about my success is defined by the number of hours I work or how long I'm in an office for to the things that I achieve so what are the outcomes and the impact that I've had in a role and actually that's now when I start any new role when I, I started a new job relatively recently one of the things that I've done is actually written down a list of things uh, that I want to be different in a year's time Mm -hmm. as a result of me being in that job and that is essentially me going this is the impact that I want to make Mm -hmm. in this role and in this organization I've not said that's based on working this many hours or or you Mm -hmm. know in a certain way it's more this is what I want to achieve and then actually if you can agree that with the people you work with the people you work for how you then go off and do that again doesn't really matter but I do think it does take that sounds kind of easy kind of shift your mindset from kind of time to almost delivery to outcomes but actually people have worked as we said at the start in a kind of time-based way for such a long time that is actually quite a big shift Mm. in mindset I think Mm. yeah I agree so so maybe that's probably my way of my what's working well yep. that flavor flexibility i think maybe if i share a time when it's not worked for me yep. and that i've kind of struggled and maybe what i learned from it so after i had my first child henry i went back to work at virgin and i did a phased return and i really remember yeah, this <laughs> and i found it so hard so i did a phased return because it's hard kind of going back to work after having your, your, your first child, especially, uh, because you, it's, all, it's all quite new, that, that mixing concept. And I also did a phase return and I also tried to do a four day week. Um, and for me, it didn't work because I work is quite a big part of my drive and what I do. Your identity. Yeah, it's a big part of my identity. And I actually found this phased kind of I'm I'm. I'm a mum and I'm blurring it into my work life and I hadn't then maybe got all my childcare set up and I just found that I was torn and and I personally operate better with really clear boundaries so for me that actual phasing and not necessarily having the childcare so to be really specific I think I went back three days a week three, at I'm first, and then three. I had maybe a couple of weeks of two days at home and then it was supposed to be four but those two days once I'd gone back to work I wanted to be at work and so there were these awkward situations where I wanted to join conference calls and I had my baby on the floor and I remember once bringing Henry into a research meeting that I had Henry on the floor at work because so for me personally that phasing didn't work because once I'd gone back to work I wanted to commit to it and I was trying to look after my child on the two days whilst my head had sort of gone to this exciting place that I find work to be. Um, And then beyond that, I tried to do four days a week and I found a really sort of similar challenge in that that day when I wasn't supposed to be doing my virgin job, I still was, I still wanted to be in those meetings and I found, and that was not about virgin, virgin were not, you know, putting that on me, that was my own challenges with actually having a boundary and sticking to it Mm -hmm. and so I think my learning is not I don't think I couldn't do that again I think I could do it but what I would go into it with is 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 you've got to be very committed to why you want to work flexibly and to sort of protect that at the heart so if I want to work flexibly and that means working four days a week to spend one day with my child then I've got I've got to really really value that or you'll trade it and that's yeah, what I was yeah. sort of doing I was trading it all the time um, and I had also had some childcare so I didn't have to be with Henry I could work so I think no if you really want to put some a change of the shape of your work my learning would be be really really clear on why why yeah, you're changing yeah. it 
make sure you really, really value that because there will be times when you might feel compromised by partly by yourself, maybe by the organisation um, asking you to do something. And you've got to understand the trade you're making. Whereas I think for me, I was sort of, it felt, I was like, oh, yeah, you I'll almost mashed all this all there. Yeah, I was like, I'll just mash all this up, it'll be fine. And then I thought, oh, I just felt torn. So I actually really remember how um, unhappy you were yeah, at that time. Yeah. I think you just found, I think it was almost you were trying to do the best of both worlds mm. and then actually not getting the best of either. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think just it was just, yeah, it wasn't working for me. So I think if I do that again in the future, I'll just be much firmer with myself it's not it's that that's the thing it wasn't the company it was entirely me and where I thought I was creating value and me sort of compromising my own boundaries so I'll I'll be better at that and I think it's probably worth then sharing my experience of working part-time because I think it's very different Mm. so I were I do work four days a week very happily Mm -hmm. um, and have done for the past couple of years so I worked four days a week before having a baby and I still work four days a week after having a baby And on that fifth day, I spend time uh, usually doing amazing if related things. So whether that some things for our podcasts or some training or um, various different kind of activities and things that we do. And for me, the scary part of working four days a week was actually asking to work four days a week. Mm. So at the time I was working at Sainsbury's and I just remember being really nervous about asking to work four days a week because I was really clear that I wanted to stay working at Sainsbury's, that I was still really committed to that job it was just that I wanted some time to do something else as well. And that's that felt very, um, A, it's very unusual. There's not that many other people doing that. So you, there's no real role models. Again, there's no one to look up to, to think, okay, so they did it, so I can ask them for advice or help. Yeah. So I did really feel like I was kind of stepping into a bit of a kind of unknown working style. And so actually I really defaulted to like the corporate world. And I remember doing a really extensive PowerPoint presentation (laughs) about why I could work four days a week and still have quite a senior job in marketing. (laughs) And I sat down with my boss uh, to say, like, I was really gearing up to it as well. It was one of those, you know, where you like thought about it way too much. And I think I'd got through about um, three slides before she was like, yeah, I totally get it. I'm really supportive. This is what we need to do next. And I was like, oh. But I've got more slides. <laughs> I've got some more diagrams, though. You know, you sure you don't want to see the rest of my diagrams? And I think what I found, and I love working. So basically, I work five days a week, but I work for two organisations, yeah. essentially, my own and, and another one. And I love it. And it works really well for me. And have you, ne- you never felt that compromise? You've never thought, oh, I've got a, that... Um, being very honest, I think what I do find is that there's something different for me in my head around not getting paid for one day mm. a week versus, I don't know, like working late or working at a weekend. Like for some reason, I don't kind of connect the two. So I'm very happy to, you know, work around the periphery of my job, four days. you know, like your four days. So, you know, I might work a bit in an evening. I might work a bit a weekend. That's, that's fine. And I, I choose to do that when I want to, but on that one day where I think, well, I'm not paid to work for that other organisation today. This is very much, I'm making a choice here about, um, you know, earning less money in that role. Um, So that's what I do. I I don't try and do uh, five days in four or anything Mm. like that. I take a 20% pay cut. That's how I choose to do it. Or not a pay cut, I choose to get paid 20% less, I guess, (laughs) um, to put it in a more positive way. Then there is something about that mindset that makes me think, well, this is my day to use as I want to you, you know, I'm, I'm sort of making that choice. So actually, though sometimes it can feel tough because you do, you know, you sometimes see genuinely those meetings go in the diary, you think, oh, I'd quite like to be in that mm. meeting or I'd quite like to be on that call. I think I'm also really passionate about what I do in that other day. And so it's not enough of a draw to make me think I'm going to start compromising. Mm. And I think there are probably three things I've learned because I've now done four days a week in two different organisations And I do think there are sort of three things that you need to be in place to make working flexibly, generally, actually, work for you. I think you need a supportive, like, direct line manager or or boss, whoever you're working for. I do think you need to be in the right job. I think some jobs do naturally lend themselves slightly more to flexibility than others. So that one I would challenge because I do think more and more you can think about things like job design, job share. I think there are more creative ways to think about every job being able to be flexible but I appreciate I think it's tougher in some than others and I think you need the right culture Mm -hmm. because it is still tough it's still a tough thing to do because you have to have a lot of confidence in yourself whether it's to leave at a certain time because you've got to go and pick up your kids from 
uh, nursery or just to leave on time because you've got other interests yeah yeah um or to not be there a day a week because you're you know doing your own business and for people to still feel like you're very committed to that other business because i'm just as committed to that role as i am to my amazing if stuff it's just that i thrive and i'm happiest doing those kind of multiple things mm. so it doesn't mean that you don't sometimes feel compromised but i am definitely happier doing the two because you've got maybe that kind of very yeah. firm boundary that you've put in place mm -hmm. So shall we move on to maybe some tips yes. that we can help people with? Um, so I think a first tip, which we, we we need more of, and you might be able to do this, or we should just find some more, is role models. We yeah. need to celebrate more people who are doing great work and have flexibility inbuilt into that, whatever that looks like for them. Um, there's something called the Part-Time Power List, which Sarah has been featured on, um, which is a, an, an annual list of people that are... are, are kind of being celebrated for doing great jobs and also um, doing that flexibly. But I don't think it has to be in a part-time power list. I think this is just about talking about flexibility. So if I say to my team, oh, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna work from home for two days a week because I just wanna get my head down, come out of meetings and do some thinking. I think, and they, they can see me as a manager working in that way. I think yeah. that role models to them that it's not about presenteeism, it's about the quality of your work. So be a role model, look for role models in your organisation or outside of them is probably my first tip. And I think on that one, if you are leading a team, don't forget the kind of the power of almost the shadow that you cast. Yes. Because I think you might be encouraging flexibility in terms of what you say, but I do think it's one of those things that it also needs to be in your actions and what you do, because people sometimes do need permission to work in a different way. And that permission sometimes coming comes from, I think, seeing the people who you know, ultimately you report into or are leading your organisation doing that. Because I remember somebody once saying to me, well, oh, I let people do whatever they want to do. They can work really flexibly. And this person worked really long hours, mm. always in the office. But she was kind of going, but anyone else can do whatever they want to do. And, mm. and I was still thinking, yes, but they're working for someone who they must see that the what that person values is, I work a lot, mm. I work at weekends and I work evenings. And I think you just, it's a really tough one because that's yeah. still that individual's choice. I have that challenge. So I tell you, yeah. uh, recently someone had said to it's me hard. on the way into work, I can't remember, they said, we were talking on the way into work, they, they were, I said, oh, what did you do last night? And they told me what they did with their children or whatever. And they said something like, I bet you just worked all night. And I was like, no. huh? <laughs> like, where, where does that perception come from? And I think because I am an always on person, it doesn't mean I'm always working, yeah. but I... I'm there if my team have got a problem or something crops yeah. up. It definitely doesn't mean I'm always working. I'm not. I do lots of other things that I fit in. Um, but it was, I, I that shadow you cast is, and sometimes you're not even realising it. That was a yeah. bit of a moment for me of, oh, that is not the perception that I want to yeah. land with yeah. the team about how I think great work is done. I actually find it a really tough one because sometimes it is way more convenient for me, genuinely, to be working between eight and nine at night mm. now especially now that um I do have a baby that I have to get back to pick up from nursery and I I sometimes do think right I'm working from eight till nine do I send these emails now or actually do I wait and send them in the mm. morning mm. um because most things can wait so I do I do sometimes actually very consciously think right I've done it but I'll wait till the next day because yeah. I am very mindful of what's what are the messages and the signal yeah. Um, so maybe a second tip then, I think, is if you if you want to work in a different way, you may have to ask for that at some point or even for your own knowledge. I think you need to be really clear about what your strengths are and where the value you add into an organisation is. I think that that helps you to stop thinking about my value is based on the number of hours I'm spending yeah. in a job or at a desk, because I can say, actually, the most value I have is in helping my team to be their best and in applying my thinking to business challenges. And I can do some of that stuff in lots of different places. Me sitting in meetings all day where I don't talk is, is not how I add the most value to a business. Yeah, I think that's that's a really good one. Um, a third top tip is, and I think this is really, really hard, um, is don't apologise. Mm. Um, you know the whole, I'm sorry, I can't come to that meeting... Oh, I'm really oh, sorry. What, what did you say the other day? Oh, well, somebody actually said about me, and they were, they were actually trying to be supportive, but they said, uh, we can't do a meeting at half eight in the morning because Sarah has childcare issues. <laughs> and uh, do you know what? They were trying to be... Um, yeah. yeah. They, they were supportive. trying to kind of accommodate me, but by saying childcare issues, I was like, 
you can't describe Max, my little boy's an issue. <laughs> he's like, it's he's not an issue, baby. he's just a baby. Um, and a very small one at that, but... Um, I think it's when you're using that language, yeah. it's quite disempowering. So I think, A, make sure you're using the right language for yourself. Now, you could call me on it, so was I brave enough to then say to that person, I don't think you should use that language? No. Um, do I think I should do that? Yes. I'll just work up to it. Um, Go you know, back to an earlier podcast about, about fear of how conflict. How much I don't like conflict, yeah. <laughs> and I also felt that it came from the right place. Yes, so that's my justification yes. for letting yeah, it go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the um, examples on this day that I love, that I read about, I think it's a man that runs, I think it was PepsiCo in Australia. He said to his team, his senior team, when you leave the office, I want you to leave loudly. So he had this kind of initiative called Leave Loudly. Mm. And it was like, when you leave... I want you to tell people you're leaving and why you're leaving <laughs> in a really kind of positive way. Yeah. And he'd got, because obviously it's in Australia, he'd got people who went like surfing some days <laughs> because like the surf was particularly good that day. And he'd be like, yeah, well, as long as, you know, it, it kind of works the business, if you want to leave at 4.30 that day because it's amazing weather and amazing surfing, that's fine. Just t- like tell people what you're going to do. And I do think, um, particularly actually women I know who work part-time or flexibly, and maybe because they are a parent, will often try and almost cover up the cracks and mm. being like of why they're not there. Will try and kind of almost keep it secret in mm. some ways. Honestly, I had someone work for me once who said um, almost proudly, "Oh, I don't think people realise I work part time." Mm. And I was thinking, I don't think that is a good thing. Yeah, that's not empowering. It's not. Yeah. And I, but actually, I think that's not that unusual I, I've done it my, my, my manager at Virgin when I was doing that mix of stuff he was like Helen just saying sorry all the time at the moment and it, yeah. and it was much more about me yeah, yeah, so. yeah I think that's a really good one and then the last one is about almost being flexible with your flexibility and this is kind of it's a tough one to get right but I do think this is a two-way street so often the individual is focused on when you think about flexibility and like why you want that flexibility whether it's to do side projects whether it's just to pursue hobbies and interests whether it's because you're a parent and or a combination of all those three um but I think it it really has to work for the organization as well and sometimes you do think I will also be flexible with my organization because they've asked me to do something particular and they've given me enough notice to do that I definitely sometimes on occasion will work on my one day that I don't work when I'm given enough notice. Sometimes people will say, right, we're doing a big team day. We're doing it on a Thursday, which is the day I don't work. Is any chance there you could work on that Thursday in six weeks' time? And I'm like, of course you can. And then what I do is I take that day back within the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's my kind of quid pro quo Mm -hmm. there, I think. Because someone actually gave me that advice. They said, if you ever do kind of change how you're working to accommodate the organisation, which is great, you, you can do that at times, make sure you can take that back again yeah. quite quickly, otherwise you'll never do it, and then you fall into kind of a pattern. Yeah. So it's about almost not compromising yourself and what you're choosing to do, but also just recognising that you need to kind of work at it together, I think. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I'm also thinking in this uh, podcast, we've come up with two nice hashtaggable things of uh, oh, yeah. flavours of flexibilities <laughs> and leave loudly. I leave quite loudly. Like, I like both those yeah, principles. Yeah. resources so things that people can look at if they're um, interested in finding out more yeah I think there's some really good resources but um, I think first of all I would actually like to do a shout out to some people you can go and get yep. more information from who are doing stuff in this space and I think there is some great uh, work happening from organisations like Digital Mums, mm-hmm. the Hoxby Collective, the Form Break Collective, the Mix, I think it's a brilliant Flex Appeal campaign and all of those people and organisations are doing great stuff to change mindsets and what what we would term create happy careers for people so yeah I think that's fantastic to see so go and have a look at those um, but also a couple of other things time wise are an organization who have been working in this I think for about 13 years in yeah. this space and they are very research orientated and they have some really good studies and lots of great stats on their website I mean they also have a lot of flexible jobs on the website but I, I particularly like the research and some of the data points they've got about the importance of flexible working if you ever want to create a powerpoint like Sarah did to talk to your manager <laughs> there are some interesting data points in there that you could take into context for that and the last thing actually it's Sarah's uh you heard this this week on Woman's Hour yeah so um I was actually ill in bed this oh, week it's not been a great week um, <laughs> no that was part of the week not being brilliant so I was listening to some podcasts I was listening to Women's Hour and on the 20th of March episode they talk about particularly actually working uh, men working fathers and also some of the legislation changes and recommendations that are being made around shared parental leave flexible working 
So it's worth listening to that. And actually, within Women's Hour, they do have quite a lot of episodes on kind of flexibility, um, if that's something you're interested in. So next week, then, we are going to be talking about building your brand. It was actually a request from somebody. Yeah. Uh, I think it was on Twitter that it came through. So we will definitely be doing that in our next episode. Personal brand, this is, isn't yes. it? Personal, personal brand. brand. Building your personal brand, how you cu- you know curate and create and tell your own personal story. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, but do stay in touch with us. As we said earlier in the episode, we love to hear from you. You can get in touch with us on Twitter, where we're at amazing underscore if. We are on on Instagram at amazing if. You can email us, get in touch at amazingif.com, or you can stalk Sarah Ellis and Helen Tupper on LinkedIn. All of those places we are available for you to come and talk to us. Thank you so much for listening this week, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.